This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Hi, I'm Katrina Webb, founder and director of New Day Leadership. New Day is known for its inspiring leadership summits and events that feature speakers and creative practitioners from around the world. Our events are attended by leaders from commercial, not-for-profit and government organisations, as well as many entrepreneurs and lifelong learners. In these times for social isolation, New Day have designed a unique six-week program of virtual leadership sessions that promise to extend on our mission to support inspired leadership for the greater good. Six weeks, six leaders, six reasons to be inspired, develop new habits, adapt to uncertainty and lead for the greater good. It starts July 1. So for more information about our amazing lineup and to register you or your team today, please visit newday.world. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Throughout the ages, people have searched for the precise alchemy of ingredients that constitute great leadership, leadership of governments, communities, and of course, leadership in organizations. But most importantly, personal leadership, the leadership we apply in our own lives, especially within the current environment, which consists of global pandemics, political uprisings, emerging technologies, and and of course, climate change. So what is that one ingredient that is so crucial to great leadership? Which one floats to the top? The answer is undeniably courage. And it makes sense when we consider that we are living in an unwritten future. And it takes courage to be a pioneer of a story unwritten. And at this exact moment in time, there are so many leaders, entrepreneurs, economists, scientists, innovators out there who are bravely redesigning, rewriting and forming thoughts around the possibilities for this unknown future. And they are the courageous people who are truly leading the way for all of us, none more so than those working on the development of a vaccine for COVID-19. That's courage. And in fact, with the, the current urgency around a vaccine, that's what I would call courage under fire. We've seen people all over the world have the courage to call out toxic stories of the past in order to heal society, flip perspectives, command action or forge the way for a more inclusive and purpose-driven world, whether that be through movements like Black Lives Matter, the school strike for climate or the Me Too movement. It's here that we see radical acts of bravery in the face of change. So I think it's fair to say that if we look at all of these examples, it is not fear that brings about change, and nor is it fear that enables an authentic connection to purpose. But it's not a lack of fear either. It's the learned ability to see that fear exists and to bravely march on through anyway. So how do we do that? How do we decode the central courage system that fundamentally drives the creation of a more purpose-driven world? This brings me to today's guest, the incredible Ryan Berman. Ryan has spent more than 20 years in the courageous ideas space and has an intimate understanding of the intricacies of emotional storytelling for the purposes of driving courageous change. He is the founder of Courageous Brands and also a social enterprise called Sock Problems. Ryan has had his methods featured in Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Inc. and Forbes. Today, he generously covers the learnings found in his latest book, Return on Courage, a business playbook for change. So without further delay, let's, uh, you know, let's get our bravery on and welcome the incredible Ryan Berman to the podcast. Welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. It's such an honour to have you beaming into the studio all the way from California, Ryan Berman. Hi, how are you? 
I am good, thank you. Excited to have you on the podcast today to decode all things courage. So to get things kicked off, uh, I want to start with a question that I believe is a, a bit of a courageous question, and it's one uh-huh. that I, uh, I ask every single guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast, and it is whether you think that purpose is an intentional decision, or do you think that the pursuit for purpose is something that is fateful or, you know, a type of destiny? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, really? we go there. Yeah, we dive straight in. I, I said courageous, right? <laughs> it is courageous. And, you know, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. What I'll tell you is that I I believe things are just better when you have intention. Yeah. And when you have self-awareness and clarity. And, you know, someone once said to me, you're even the kite or you're flying the kite. <laughs> yeah, And I would rather so be flying. Yeah, I'd rather be flying the kite and making the decisions on where we go. I can't decide every place we're going to land. I can't control certain things. But when I have clarity on my purpose and I make it real, I always like to say, state it and create it. When you state it and actually go after it, you actually have a shot. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, I, I've often, um, in speaking to a lot of people and asking a lot of people this question, most people say both. Um, but what I will say is that regardless of whether you believe in fate and destiny, it all starts with intention. It all starts with the ability to show up and then the wind may come, uh, you know, from any which way, but you need to be there in the first place. Who knows? I mean, I almost see the flip. I think until maybe it was fate, you know, maybe you had something, you know, for me, the courage, this might be a good segue, but like my battle with the word courage growing up like I didn't really see myself as courageous but when I really look back at some of the choices I made for me I'm like wow that actually was courageous of me to leave New York City and move to San Diego where there really isn't a creative community and to build one from here Mm. and it was courageous of me to start my first company 15 years ago as a guy that had zero qualifications never went to business school was a television radio major so it's sort of funny how certain words, when you finally smoke them out, you look at them and you're like, wow, I, I really kind of have always taken a different path. And even though I wouldn't define it back then as courageous, I see why this word has been maybe f- like rolling through my veins, even when I didn't even realize it. Mm. That is a great segue to my next question, because the theme of the decoding purpose for season two actually has a focus on turning points, which is Mm. in in some ways what you're talking about there. And the reason behind that is because I've personally found that purpose is, is often born from, in some cases, a choice, but in many cases, a crisis or, you know, some kind of moment of no return. And in researching for today's interview, I heard you use the term negative blessing. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Because, you know, this kind of captures the same idea that, you know, often where there is a crisis or a negative event, it does act as the catalyst for purpose, where we actually have a negative blessing take place. So I know you just kind of glanced over one or two moments in your life which you may have uh, seen as a negative blessing, but, you know, were there any really significant moments that you recall that really defined your purpose and your pursuit to activate courageous brands? Yeah, we got to, it's like, how much time do you have? (laughs) Let's go there. I don't mind. I've got no clock on this interview. (laughs) All right. Yeah. Oh, no, it's Friday. We almost have the weekend. That's (laughs) right. For 48 hours straight. Um, Yeah, I think the concept of a crisis, it could be something small to the world, but big to you. Mm. And when I was in New York city where I I really got to learn from some amazing people and I came out of the mad men era. So I learned storytelling when could you tell a story in 15 seconds when that really mattered called commercials. And, uh, and uh, I had spent seven years at a company and it was it was a 700 person creative agency and so i i got to like play in the big leagues and a, a new executive correct creative director came in and and i i don't think he knew my name and let me go mm. and um i just remember feeling like embarrassed and there was like a lot of shame i was mad you know i was loyal um and i think it was that moment at the time like i'd say it was like a thousand day scab that needed to heal up yeah 
but without that, I don't move to California. You know, if I don't move to California, I don't meet my wife. You know, if I don't, if I don't move here, I don't have my kids. Um, I definitely don't become an entrepreneur. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was remember thinking how, you know, sometimes fear isn't the worst thing if you use it the right way. And the way that I was using it was too stubborn to fail. Like I could hear the little voices in my head of people in New York being like, I knew Ryan Berman would fail. And yeah, that that would drive me. I mean, I work six, six and a half days a week for the first three or four years. And but, you know, now looking back at that moment, this thing that I was embarrassed about or like I had shame about or was mad about, I now smile at because without it, I don't go do these things. And if I don't go do these things, I don't write a book. I don't study courage. And and like I just don't see how the rest of my life would have landed where it is. And I do feel like this is for the sports fans. Like I feel like I'm in extra time a little bit Yeah. that I've already done more than I ever thought I would do on this planet. And so it just makes me smile that I can keep going and stay curious and see where it takes me. Mm, keep showing up at that level. And, you know, what I love about your story there is in a conversation about courage, talking about themes such as failure or shame or vulnerability, because the ability to go, you know, go through and experience those emotions in order to transform into um, a different version of you. As you said, if you had not have gone through that, you wouldn't have met your wife, you wouldn't have become an entrepreneur, but you had to go on a journey of being courageous enough to look at some of those shadow emotions. And I think, you know, that's, um, that does take courage. It takes guts to do that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a seriously competitive human being, Yeah, you know, so like I, uh, I want to be great with my time on this planet. And I, I don't know why I'm wired that way. And it's, it's really irrelevant, frankly, to me. It's just, it just my is just who I am. And so the idea of how do I stay on the top of my game and how does courage help me do that? You know, there's I'm sure we'll, if you're talking about decoding here, we're going to probably uncrack um, my definition of courage pretty soon. But a, a big part of it is, there's a big difference between talking about courage and doing courage and taking action and being courageous. Mm. And, and for me, even, you know, I, the second sort of negative blessing story that I have is I was running a 70 person creative agency, creative marketing firm in San Diego. And I was writing my book to try to position us against Los Angeles and New York and these like known creative meccas in the States. And as I go on this journey and I start sitting and listening to some of the most courageous people on the planet or leaders on the planet, and I start to just sort of put myself through what I'm learning, you know, I just couldn't lie to myself. I I, I was like, wow, if I'm really courageous, I'll, I'll fire myself. Mm. I'm, I'm not playing at the level that I want to play at. And I, in some ways, it's a violation of my personal values. And then, by the way, this doesn't mean like my partners are evil or yeah. I know everything. It just meant like in my heart, I wanted to do something different. And and uh, and yeah, I definitely felt like at times that a, like a fifth year senior sort of numb walking around the halls of my own company. So the joke is that I positioned, in, you know, I wrote the book to position my last company, but it pretty much gave me the courage to fire myself, start over and start building Courageous, which is my current company. And and again, another beautiful segue, because in the book, uh, there's a section that is bolded, which says, either change drives you or you drive change. Uh, and this aligns beautifully with the kite metaphor that you used earlier. Now, in a conversation <clears throat> about purpose in the turning points, This is, you know, this is where we respond to crisis and we have a choice in that moment. We go through something, we're right in that negative blessing and we can do one of two things. We can retract with fear or we can courageously choose purpose and show up for our purpose. So with that in mind, if we find ourselves in that negative blessing, what are the tools we can use to be courageously conscious and consciously courageous at that exact moment or period of time in the present moment? Such a good question. Mm. And I think one of the things that sent me down this rabbit hole 
that ended up being Return on Courage, which is my yeah. book, was was the existing definition of courage. So if you actually look at the definition of courage, it is, according to the dictionary, it is the ability to do something that frightens you. Mm. And I'm looking at this definition and going, does anybody want to do this? Like, please step forward. And I'm taking a step back. Like, I'm out. I, I can't imagine I'm alone. And then layer on in the corporate setting, like double no, out, fully out. <laughs> right? So, so... Mm. What I realize is that people aren't thinking about courage under that the guise of that definition when they need it most. And you need courage in the messy middle, like you had mentioned, in a moment, in a decision, when things aren't all figured out. And if courage was a journey word, then ultimately doing something meaningful was the destination. So I wanted to come up with a definition that could help people spot courage in real time when they needed it most. Mm. So... Uh, you know, my definition, it's a bit algebraic. It's knowledge plus faith plus action equals courage. And, you know, in life and business, you're never going to have every bit of knowledge you need to make a call, right? Which mm. is why we need faith. And, you know, when we talk about faith, we're not talking about religion in this sense. We're talking about inner belief. We're talking about intuition. We're talking about all that experience you have, that gut feeling. And, how often have you known what to do and you felt it was the right thing and you just couldn't pull the trigger on it? You just couldn't do it. Mm. And to me, that's the point of, of action. And the irony here is two of three in any direction is not courageous. So knowledge and faith without action is paralysis. Faith and action without knowledge is reckless. And knowledge and action without faith, if you're numb on the inside, if you're just sort of going through the motions, you're working on status quo working on safe if you're don't have that little voice in your head kind of going oh my gosh what am i doing this is crazy then you're probably just kind of contributing to the noise versus really driving your purpose forward and that little voice in your head that little that little nervous faith uh, metric i think that's where your purpose lives i think mm. that's where you have the courage to move forward even if you are afraid right because it, there's a higher calling for you mm. And what I love about that equation between knowledge, faith and action is that whilst on some level you, you're talking about, um, you know, our cognitive function, like knowledge is the ability to go out and a very logical level get information that's going to inform our decision. But what you've also spoken about there is the visceral experience of courage. Like I don't think you can think courage into being. It's something that mm. you feel. Like it, as you said, it's intuitive. It comes from the inside out. Like how have you experienced courage as a feeling? I mean, any any time that the lieutenant of our bodies is telling you not to do something, yeah, which is your, which is I your love that nerve. the lieutenant of our bodies. I might <laughs> right. steal that one. That's great. S swipe away. Yeah, which is which is your central nervous system, which doesn't exactly just show up in normal layman conversations. You're not like, oh, hi Ash, how's your central nervous system doing? Oh, <laughs> hey Rebecca, my central nervous system's doing just fine. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not, it's not how we talk. Um, so when you start to separate out that the captain, right, you are not the same as your thoughts. And as long as you trust the, the those, okay, this is a little scary, this is that moment, and you go, I understand this is scary, and we're going to push through anyway, and we're back to fear. And, you know, I always like to say, you know, face it and replace it. Like, figure out what the biggest fear you have. There's a famous proverb that fear and courage are brothers, right? You can't actually mm. get to the courageous choice without channeling it through fear. But most of us suppress that fear versus address the fear. So smoke it out, make it real, make it tangible, and then go right at it. So Ryan, do you have like any daily practice for courage? So uh, uh, to give you an analogy, I'm thinking about this like yoga. You know, you get on the mat every day. It's a practice. It's something that you can do to, to, to tune in, to, you know, keep courageously fit, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's two triggers that I think mm. most people can create. And I think we would have to have a whole other session here about technology and the role tech plays. And is tech really good or is tech really hurting us? Like, yeah. Are we really evolving or which way are we going here? And That's I a whole nother podcast. <laughs> whole nother podcast, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. But what I will say is when you can control tech to create triggers for you, you you're on your way. And so I'll give you an example. 
um, like I mentioned, I'm a television radio major, right? Who, mm. Who's been a story maker for a career. I am, I am the furthest thing from a Cambridge PhD or immunologist or clinical psychologist, right? But going through the research and the interviews for my book, I'd come out with this idea of, oh, that's interesting. We have the thing that, that, that lieutenant, that central nervous system that's calling all the shots. And we've, we've really created no training to combat that. Like we have zero strategies in play to deal with that, to cope mm-hmm. with that. And I'd come up with this idea of, oh, I wonder if I could develop a central courage system to combat mm-hmm. your central nervous system. And so imagine as a, storyteller coming up with that and that part i liked i'm like i know this feels right in my heart but i also was dealing with the knowledge side where i'm like i'm not qualified to talk about this Mm. you know no science background but so basically what i did was i changed the label on my phone when my alarm went off in the morning and every morning for three years when my first alarm goes off the label on my phone says build strong central courage systems and the more I see that trigger every day, so it's been a thousand days about now since I've seen it, mm. I've trained my myself to be okay with that and to be able to repeat it and to be confident about saying it. And I think that's kind of what this is about. Like, I do believe you can train people to be courageous. I think you can build that muscle. It doesn't make it easy every single time out, but like, this is just one way, right? How do you create triggers Change the labels on your phone so you can mm. see the things you need to see. If you need to see something three times a day, if you need to see something once a week, start to create that behavior change in you so mm. you can go out and do the things you need well, to do. It's almost just, you know, building the neural pathways to check in with yourself with regards to how your central courage system is going and just being deeply conscious about it. I mean, we're back to your first question, right? Yeah. So the intention, like, am I being mm. intentional about my mission, about wow, how cool would it be if I, if I could spend the rest of my life with people that want to stretch that are, they, maybe they're afraid, but they're going for it. They're taking action. Right? Yeah. So, so I'm trying to design a life where the 10 to 20% that want that, you know, are in my sphere and I'm having conversations with those people. Mm. So Ryan, I think it's fair to say that we're at a pretty interesting point in time within the context of COVID and it is undeniably a a call for courage uh, for everyone. How are you and your family coping in California? Well, thanks for asking. You know, honestly, I'm, it's a sensitive topic Yeah. and I want to be mindful of, I guess we have a hundred thousand people here in the States who have passed away from it. And, um, I, you know, luckily my, knock on wood, my family has not been, you know, not in jeopardy at this particular moment. But Mm. I got to tell you, as a guy that lived on airplanes for like the last year, keynoting all over the place, it's been kind of nice to have dinner with my family every night. Yeah. Yeah. There has Um, been some silver lining there. Yeah. And you already mentioned it. it, You know, even you drive change or change drives you. Mm. And. I, I guess this is my way of saying, like, you know, we can agree that change is happening, whether you like it or not. And sometimes if when change drives you, that's not the worst thing in the world. So the, the, the ability for me to have change drive me and I actually feel much more productive mm. right now. I, I thought I did my best work on an airplane. Right. But now that I look at it, I actually do my best work at home. Mm. <laughs> right. I just need to block off time you know, to get my thinking going. Um, so yeah, do I miss flying? No, this has been pretty amazing to be here and just to spend time with my family and reconnect. Very interested to see like everybody else, what, you know, what uh, tomorrow looks like for all of us. And no question, I, I've i seen uh, an uptick on some pretty big companies saying, hey, we we, we know that we need to be inspired right now. And we think that a little dose of courage will go a long way. And I've been able to do a number of virtual keynotes mm. to help sort of, you know, nudge or unlock the thinking inside teams, especially because people are looking for creative ways to just do that. Yeah. Look, it's it's one thing that I have definitely observed is that those who have been able to 
to, you know, to step into courage and to go, well, you know what, we're in this crazy time where, you know, on an economic level, a, a colleague of mine referred to it as his words, a political straitjacket, where we're literally gridlocked between the loss of life the loss of livelihood or the loss of personal freedoms. And, you know, what do we do in that? We can, you know, we either sit in the corner almost paralysed, which is totally understandable in that context, or we choose courage. And and those who I have seen choose courage all have stepped into a place of how can I help, how can I heal, and how can I build hope, Uh, whether that be Mm. you doing virtual keynotes or, you know, the nurses on the front line. And and in that sense, seeing courage and purpose come together as a way to help people, you know, navigate such uncertain times with some level of certainty has been, again, one of those silver linings out of COVID-19. First of all, it's a beautiful line. You know, mm. as, a, as, a, as a lexiconist, you know, I appreciate alliteration. So I mm. love that. How can I help? You know, how can I heal and how can I build hope? I think it's a beautiful thought. Uh, you know, I think, I think we're realizing, and this is, this is hard for me as a guy that gets compensated sometimes to, to take a cloudy situation and, and bring clarity, right? Mm. So, um, but I think this is a great example that, there's a duality of thoughts that at first glance feels complicated, right? Mm. You're grieving and it's okay to grieve, right? And you're growing and it's okay to grow all at the same time. And some people, it's okay. It's okay to just sit back and watch Netflix for 12 hours straight if that's what you need to do. If that's what you through, need to do, that's right. Right? Yeah. Which is, I think, the heal part of what you're, what you're suggesting. Mm. And then, well, yeah, it's, you know, that, what that, uh, how can I heal? How can I help? How can I build hope? Can apply to yourself as much as anyone else, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I I really think, um, you know, this. I used to say prior, you know, life before COVID. Mm. It's like a, you know, BC. Yeah, like BC. Before, I've used I've used that yeah, framework you know, too. Life, yeah. Life, life before COVID. That the advice I would give a lot of company leaders is, you know what? Let's think more. Do. You know, yeah. let's think more. Do let's let's get out there. Let's take action. Let's 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 try something. Let's iterate off what we learn, but let's keep experimenting. And for the first time, I think it's flipped. I think for a while, it's you know what? Let's do more. Think like this is the time to get clear on what matters most to you. And if I'm if I'm listening to this episode, I think it's okay to like start with yourself. And you know, this is hopefully this is not a shameless plug for the book, but. <laughs> that, like, That's okay. I'm happy to plug your book. Having read right. it myself, it is full of so many practical takeaways that I, I can honestly say any leader who works through that book is is going to have tangible outcomes they can integrate into their working life. Okay, so let's take a full. Yeah. We're going to fully plug my book. Right yeah, now. let's go there. Sorry let's now. do it. Um, so the way the book is written, the front half is the why now. Like, why courage now of all things? And this is before COVID. And then there's a three-page, as you know, midpoint that's called Break Glass Before Emergency because we kind of need to know how to be courageous before Mm. we need it. And then the back half is the how. How do you do it? We talk to tears about our why, know our why, find our why. But where's the how? And so the easiest way to start is, like I said, let's, let's turn this back on you. And can you truly and honestly rattle off your personal values? Do they really drive your behavior, drive your decisions? Mm. And less than 1% of the population, I imagine, I don't actually have the numbers on this, but I imagine can really run this exercise where they have clarity as to why they're wired the the way that they are. Mm. And I can tell you when I didn't have this level of clarity, it would get me in trouble. I would lose a lot of time feeling bad about myself. I, I thought I was a people pleaser. Right. And I, I could t- I could think of a number of occasions where it, like in my last company, I, I remember a particular creative pitch where we had it was like the long table room and my whole team's down one side and their team's down the other. And my job was like, tell, tell a joke, crack a joke, get out of the way. Right. Make my mm. team feel comfortable. Get out of the way. And I cracked my joke and I had a, a, an older uh, CEO cross table. I got nothing. I got zero. Not a, like, not a wrinkle. That icebreaker didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for playing. And yeah. and um, and I remember 
on my team, well, the show must go on. So they're on slide three, slide nine, slide 12. And I'm, I'm parked on slide one. Like I am parked feeling bad about myself out of the game, wondering why I'm a people pleaser. And if I would have had this clarity, so my, my number one personal core value is playfulness. Like mm. I take my work seriously, but not myself that seriously. And, and uh, this man was very serious. And so if I would have had that clarity, this, it would just would have bounced off me. Like that thought, like, oh, we're just wired differently. You know what? Nathan down there is super serious. They could talk about super serious things all day long. Mm. Like, this is just not my guy. And so, again, the amount of time I save now, and you can't do this with your family, by the way. Not a good idea to do this with your family. But with everybody else, like once you know who you are, you can start to design the people you you were meant to spend time with. Yeah. You know, that's why you and I, you know, we probably wouldn't have met if five, 10 years ago, it wouldn't have made sense. I wasn't ready. I don't know if you were ready, but like now I feel like I'm ready to talk about, you know, I'm passionate about courage. I'm, I'm yeah. passionate about this topic. Yeah. You know, as I, it's interesting having a look at the values piece in the book. I personally found it interesting because, I mean, as you know, I'm all about purpose, but in looking through your book, I became um, I almost shocked myself that I really didn't have clarity around my values. And it really got me thinking more about that. And, and when I get a little bit of time on the weekend, I'm going to go through the process in your book, which, as I said before, it's so practical, which I was like, great, I can do the work. Um, but I was like, you know what, I really need to get clear on this for the reason you're talking about, from the point of uh, being able to influence myself or create influence within my community and with my purpose, but actually also to understand what to say no to and to have the courage to say no where something isn't in alignment with my values. And it was interesting, you know, despite all the self-work I've done over the years, I'm like, how don't I have clarity on this? It seems so obvious when, when you look at it. But I dare say, um, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there who haven't done that work. Uh, yeah, you're not alone. Yeah. And, and by the way, it's it's easy to like, like, of course I know myself. Mm. <laughs> I've been living with myself my whole life, Yeah, you know, and... Uh, but maybe all of a sudden when you look at like that Facebook post or Instagram post that somebody's gloating on, that just rubs you the wrong way. Yeah. Like, you're that's like, why? probably a, that's a violation of a value. And, and so, yeah. And you already nailed it. The, the amount of time you'll save once you have this level of clarity, I'm telling you, it's going to change your, it's going to change the game for you. I really, this is not you, you, but the metaphorical you, yeah. right? I, I think it'll change it for you too, but just having that level of clarity on how you should be making decisions and how you should operate is key. Awesome. And, and look, I want to definitely dive uh, dive a little further into the price model, or is it the, the courageous system? That's not the proper, can correct me there, the correct name. Right there. <laughs> I, I was there, not quite. You're right there. No, it's the price model. Yeah, the price I mean, model, yeah. We, yeah, so again, it's a little complicated because the process works for both people and for businesses. So when we talk about we talk about it for people. It's like, how do you develop a central courage system? Central like, courage system. That was what I was looking for. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a price. There's a price of, of building your central courage system. And if we were talking about companies, usually we say there's a price of becoming a courage brand. And for those who haven't picked up on it, how could you? Price is actually an acronym. It's a five-step process. And I guess it's important to know that, well, where did this process really come from? It, it came from me pretty much getting quiet over a thousand days and interviewing what I call the, the, the three B's, the brave, the bullish and the brainiac. And on the brave side, I got to sit with Navy SEALs and tornado chasers and army infantrymen and, and astronauts. And like, I was fascinated by how they could put their lives on the line for a higher purpose. Mm. And I wanted to understand that. Um, one of my favorite lines of the whole journey was a woman named Loretta Hidalgo, who's a founding astronaut at Virgin Galactic. And she said her definition of success is when there's no daylight between the personal you and the professional you. Mm. 20 years in the service business, you know, sacrificing myself, maybe 1% at a time, taking that phone call I shouldn't take, or, or maybe sort of surrendering to a CEO on an idea I never should have presented in the first place. And it had me driving back in silence with my hands in the 10 and 2 position from Orange County to San Diego, thinking how this book is now a very different book than I thought I was writing. And the joke's on me. I'm writing the book because I need the book. Yeah. And, Always um, the way, isn't it? It's just funny how 
that kind of works. But yeah, I feel like like Rocky, like I got to go to the metaphorical woods and chop wood and get myself strong to, to go out as a new person in the world. And so, you know, and then the other bees was the bullish. So just people at Apple and Amazon, Google, Harvard, Method Soap. And, you know, what was amazing is that this group of people, I didn't pay them and they weren't clients. They just, the word resonated with them and they allowed me into their lives and shared how, you know, it's sort of fascinating that some of the, the largest companies on the planet were also the most agile. Mm. And you would think it was the nimble company, the small company that can move quickly. So how are they doing that? And then the final B was the Brainiac. And the Brainiac was just the clinical, you know, the, the science side, like what's going on in our brains and how are we wired? I got to speak to John Asaraf, who's the co-writer of The Secret, and Nicholas Alp, who's a Cambridge PhD and immunologist. And he really was my brain Sherpa through the whole thing, just sort of making it easy for me to understand who is is really calling the shots here. And you learn that our brains are really like onions. They're like reverse onions. And yeah. then that thing that happened to you in high school is still there. And you never did anything about it other than just cope with it. And um, so you throw all that in the soup and you come out the other side with the, with a, a, a step-by-step process for teaching people how to be calculated with their courage. Yeah. And that, that's price. Well, I'm definitely going to decode that a little uh, a little down the line in the interview. So I want to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, but before, you know, before we do that, I want to kind of jump back in time. So as a result, I did a little bit of a, a, a bit of research on your professional journey to date. And I think it'd be fair to say that you're a bit of a serial founder and you've definitely been, you know, part of quite a few courageous brands over the years. Um, now, what I really specifically want to talk about, though, is sock problems, which as a social enterprise model, I absolutely loved. And I'm going to tell you why. One of my, I guess, my little gripes about this idea of brand purpose is the idea that how can a brand even have a purpose if people, you know, the employees or clients don't personally align with that purpose. I really feel that purpose is something that's got to be real for the individual. So this is why I absolutely loved sock problems. So with that in mind, can you tell us a little bit about sock problems? And, you know, a two-in-one question here, whether it was an intentional decision to create a brand and a product that in every sense of the word tapped into personal purpose. Yeah, so I had this idea for a decade. And I was just sitting there doing nothing with it. And then you start writing a book about courage and the little voice bubbles back up and it's like, how, how courageous are you really? Mm. So the irony here is sock problems pretty much is a manifestation of the book and of price, the process we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah. And I looked at those a many give one, get one companies and was like, let's well, not really give one, get one. It's, right? Like it costs them 50 cents to make and they're charging you 40 bucks. Like how's that give one, get one? doesn't feel even. And so I wanted to come up with a company that really looked at things differently. And that's where sock problems came from. And the idea is that sock is both a noun and a verb. So not only is, are we creating socks, but each sock socks a different problem in the world. If you go to sockproblems.com, you'll see we're striving to sock racism or yeah. sock inequality, uh, sock hate, sock cancer. If, if there's a, we're actually just uh, launching in about 11 minutes from now, our sock COVID initiative. Oh, and so amazing. The idea is we're literally giving targeted cash back to partners that are socking problems. And every sock has a charity partner associated with it. Um, I am a storyteller. I am not an expert in socking problems, but our partners are. So that's who we send the money back to. Um, it's been a hard 18 months. It's been a lot of fun, but with not much funding, we're just moving as fast as we can go. Yeah. And um, our tagline is care, wear, share. So if you care, hopefully you want to wear. And if you wear, hopefully you'll share it for it. Yeah, well, look, I, I just personally think there's so much that corporate organisations who are looking to really understand the nature of organisational purpose can learn so much from this business model because, look, don't get me wrong, I do 
completely believe in social impact and socially conscious brands, but I would call that having a return on impact. And I'm being quite intentional about my use of language there just because <laughs> I believe that purpose is fundamentally a human experience. Um, and, I, and I just think if there was a way that organisations could embed the sock problems philosophy of, you know, we all wear the same socks to work, but what we care about is fundamentally different, that there would be some magic in that with regards to driving purpose from the inside out and really starting with your people. Well, again, it's a win, 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 you know, yeah. it's, you know, I think we're all passionate about different things. Yeah. We're all affected by different things for all the reasons we all know. And, but usually it's like, how do you express that? And so in some ways that that's what we're trying to do is to give you a tangible item yeah. that makes you feel good, not just on your feet, but on, on your, on your heart as well. Mm. And, and then again, I, our hope is that, Many companies that are passionate about socking different problems can come to us and we can develop socks with them and send 25% of the proceeds back to these different partners that are really taking on complicated issues. Mm, amazing work. Now, it's you're been ca- fun, you know, because I get to use my superpower. And, and, and in, in some ways, my top two values are at play, right? So playfulness, yeah. if, you've, you know, if you've had a chance to see me do any of my keynotes like i call them sock talks i don't wear shoes so you know i get to wear whatever whatever uh the problem of the month is i'm usually rocking those socks and then creativity which i think is my my superpower you know like i love how you can you can sort of use creativity to to move business and i think i wish most more business leaders knew the power of creativity to the bottom line and i guess that's part of my quest is to to go down that path and see where it takes us So I want to talk about another superpower of yours. And, you know, I think a big part of your process across all of your your businesses is around creating courageous brands and and you do that via storytelling. So what I want to understand is what are the components of a courageous brand story? Like what makes it courageous? Well, great question. I think every brand on the planet is somewhere between a coward brand and a courage brand. Yeah. So I think we start there. So for one second, if you're listening and you've made it this far, that's awesome. So just call time out on your business and honestly ask yourself, where are you on the spectrum? Are you a coward brand, a stasis brand, an iterative brand, an aspirational brand, or a courage brand? And what I've learned is that most companies made their way and they they found a way to invent themselves but when it comes to the reinvention the second wave that's where we get tight that's where we start to like hold on to every dollar and cent we can and we don't want to take on that next that next wave and so to me courage brands they're not surprisingly leading through their values and those values are modern and they're driving behavior of the employees and those employees actually want to be there right there there's purpose for why they're coming to work. It's not just about making a buck. And um, I always like to say it's not enough to know your why anymore. You have to have a rally cry in that why. So Mm. what's the rally cry that keeps your team around? And if there's not that rally cry, you're going to have an attrition issue. Mm. And the final sort of note I'll mention for now is my background got me like, like super, super lucky that as a storyteller, now it should be the same story being told back internally as it is externally. And the companies that have curtains and are telling the world one thing, but it's an entirely different story on the inside. You know, it's like a mm. rot- rotten apple on the inside. The, to the, they're communicating it as a shiny apple on the outside. That's, that's where we have a problem. And look, for both of us, to be honest, Rebecca, like coming out of COVID, now more than ever, the next generation will demand working at purpose-driven companies, and it can't be this fake purpose. It no. has to be a truthful purpose, and there has to be emotion in that purpose. Absolutely, and and look, even um even when we look at 
purpose on a personal level, uh, I have a big focus on narrative, so much so that I break it down into three whys. And I've got the marketing why, which is the one you share with the world. Then I've got the vulnerable why, which is that, that very deep decision to choose life and to choose, you know, why do I show up today? But then finally, I have the courageous why. And, and a big part of the courageous why is, is really about a pioneering purpose. So the ability to have the courage to write an unwritten or a revolutionary story, but then to make it real. And I think from what I'm understanding from from your perspective is courageous brands really have an ability to create a story alignment. They make it real. And one of the quotes you shared in the book was a Japanese proverb that said, vision without action is a dream, action without vision is a nightmare. And I thought that was a poignant summary of exactly what you're talking about here. Yeah, and I, and I love your three whys. And I'm trying to, I'm wondering if each why rattles or ladders up to knowledge, faith, and action. Oh, that would be interesting. Right, so the courageous yeah. why is the faith. What was your first why? The, f- the first why was the marketing why. And in some ways that could align with the knowledge. It's that it's the marketing why is like, for me, it's about decoding purpose and amplifying voices changing the world. You know, it's what I put in my marketing collateral. It sounds good. Mm. But that's very different to what you're talking about, which is the faith, which is the vulnerable why, which is, you know, for example, at the moment we're in the middle of COVID. What is getting me up today? Really, mm-hmm. like what? what is that um, intuitive pull, that guts, that grit that is inspiring me to show up? Because that's a very different feeling to my marketing why. They're two very yeah. different things. And I think, you know, when people are talking about discovering their why, they have to understand the nuances of what why really means. Yeah, and I guess the courageous why is the action. The action. So that's the, la- the last piece. Exactly. Like, are, we, are we talking about this or are we doing something about it? Exactly. There you go. We, yeah, might another, have, we might have to collaborate on a virtual session one day. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. A, a de- we've decoded. Yeah. We have I mean, decoded. And, you know, another way that I think about knowledge, faith, and action is what do I think about it? How does that make me feel? And what am I going to do about it? Yeah. Just think, feel, do. Knowledge, faith, and action. And again, all I'm attempting to do, like you are, is to give people tools that they can use in real time that's on the level, practical tools so they can spot courage when they need it. So, Ryan, obviously, you know, we want um, we want everyone out there to go and get your book to get a, a complete and in-depth understanding of the price model. Now, we, we already touched on prioritise your values, but I'm just wondering if you want to just very quickly give us a, a speedy overview of the central courage system. Yeah, so the first two steps are what I would call like organizational health steps. And you don't get to pass go to the final three, the what I would say are the courageous business steps without really having the first two on lockdown. So um, price stands for actually stands for prioritize, rally, identify, commit and execute. And it's prioritized through values, which we've talked a little bit about today. And then once we know who we are, it's about rallying believers. So finding your people. And I do believe you even make believers or fake believers. Mm. It's going to be very hard to fulfill a mission or a purpose if you've got people that don't believe in the mission. It's just not the way we work. It's not the way we operate. And once we have the right team, we can address the next step, which is identify fears. As I mentioned, fear and courage are brothers. Um, the way I look at fears, it's broken down in the book. It's a, it's a better way to SWAT, in my opinion. And so, you know, mm. strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats has somehow been on the top of the podium for six decades with nothing to really challenge it. But every time I do it, my weakness is an opportunity. My strength is an opportunity. My weakness is a threat. It's just incredibly cloudy. So the way I try to break it down in the book is through business fears. So what's the industry fear that we should be worried about? What's the product fear? What's the perception fear, which is marketing? What's the the personal fear? Because we're all doing the best we can to stay human at work and really giving you a better tool to assess and be proactive about that assessment. Mm-hmm. So uh, on what could take you or your, or your company down and the C is commit to a purpose. So we, I think, you know, plenty about that. Um, and then finally, when you have all four of those steps, it's time to go, it's execute your action. And 
one of the big sort of ahas is that most of us don't know which knowledge to follow at work. We don't know how to build internal or external faith, and we don't know when or where to take action. So mm. sort of this, the amalgamation of the data from price helps you make calculated decisions with your courage. So there was one section that I just wanted to unpack a little further, and it was it was a concept that you used under the rally believers part. And you titled this The Believership. Now, the reason I want to understand the believership a little more is because it's not only relevant to leadership or leading a courageous brand, but as this is a podcast about purpose, it's also for anyone with a desire, I think, to influence change, to amplify an idea or maybe even start a movement. So can you define for our listeners what believership is all about and and how we can go about creating that? Yeah, I guess I have to start preface by saying this is what happens when you have a writer (laughs) <laughs> that makes up that makes up words. Oh, you know, we, we like a little bit of uh, make believe words. It works. So, I like the word believership. Let's use it. <laughs> yeah, let's take it and run with it. So, you know, I just had a gripe with the word leadership because I think poor leaders turn leadership into cheerleadership, and and we start rah rahing to our staff, and and some of that turns into fakeness, mm. and you know, ten percent of your staff may fall for it, but like your high producers see right through it. So I like the idea of believership and the sole goal of that believership, that leadership team is to make believers in all directions, whether it's making believers out of your team, or maybe it's making believers out of your board um, or making believers out of, you know, your customers or prospects. And again, like I said, we're even making believers or fake believers. Now, how do you make a believer, right? I mean, some of it's common sense. It's like, well, respecting makes believers. Right? Caring makes believers. Um, another one is repeating makes believers. So it's incredibly annoying sometimes for the, the leadership team to say the same thing over and over again for three years, right? But your staff is looking for consistent behavior mm. from you. So that means you have to have clarity as to why you're doing the things you're doing. And we're, we're back to purpose. We're, we're back to that emotional purpose, right? which is driving that believership. And I'm sure if you're leading a team right now, there's probably someone on your team that's very talented but not a believer. Mm. And they're probably messing with your culture. And that toll is taxing. And I would rather take someone who believes that may not be at that level any day over someone talented that's toxic to my culture. Yeah, okay. So we had there, you know, pretty much we had certainty, commitment, consistency, and the creation of a common purpose within believership. Yeah. Mm, again, beautiful. It's all clarity. You know, it's all mm. it's all about how clear are we and, and where are we going. And, and and by the way, it doesn't mean like you know it all, right? I mean, I was this is sort of hot off the press, so you can tell me if this lands or not, but I was sort of playing around with, and I'm an alliteration junkie, so I was like, what what really makes a good believership? And the first thing I think is listening. Yeah. Right, are we, are we, are we providing a platform for our team who are really on the ground in real time? Right? And we, just to like stop you there for a second, the courage to really listen, opposed to just hearing, like to really hold space for someone and get out of the way, that does take courage. I think so. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think so. I think we're we're just, you know, we're hardwired for ego and yeah. you know, we're going to need a whole other session. But um, And then that listening really leads to the second L, which is learning. Mm. Like, are we are we learning in real time? Are we, are we willing and open to learn? And I think the third L is loving. And I think that's a word that we need more of and we're afraid sometimes to actually like show our team some love. But like, wow, if you're going to give me 60 hours of your life a week, you know, like I'm going to love you. Like I am, if you're, if you believe in the same things that what we're trying to do here, there, there needs to be love. And I want to feel the love in our work. I want to feel the love in the way we operate and the way we communicate. And I kind of feel like if you're doing all those three L's then you're, you're, you are doing the fourth L, which is leading. Mm. And I think that's what believership is really all about is, are you listening to your team? You know, are you really learning in real time? Are you, are you sort of like mirroring back that love, right? If they feel that love from you. They're going to uh, replicate that, by the way. And then all of that is sort of summed up in, in the leading factor. So are we leading the way? Mm. And there is your next book, 
I'll be purchasing that one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's a, it's definitely a blog post. Yeah, um, no, I love the concept. Yeah, awesome. Ryan, I've actually, um, I've come to my last question today. And what I'd like to understand is if courage is currency and one we are able to bank, then fundamentally, what is the return on living a deeply meaningful and courageous life in business and in simply being a courageous human? Right. So your first question and your last question are your, your hardest questions. Good to know. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's just about having life in alignment for you. Yeah. Right. And so if you can have your whole life in alignment and you can spend your time, whether you're at work or at home, fully like following your path, following your purpose, then it's a life worth living. And I always like to say that courage breeds courage. So when you do it and you experiment with it, even if you fail a little bit, but you push that thing forward, it makes it easier for you to do it again. And that's really about building confidence, you know, and staying curious with your courage. Conversely, I think fear breeds fear. So mm. when you feel that you're in a place where fear rules the roost and your neck is disappearing <laughs> and you're nervous, then you know, is that really the organization for you? And so, again, if all of this is about designing, it may take time. It's not easy, right? Designing a life that's perfectly in alignment for you. And for me, like I said, I had to, I had to actually, like, eject myself out of my last business so I could be back in alignment with my values, which mm. did change, too. I would rather do that. And, you know, in many of my keynotes, I start off with sort of sharing the story that I was sad, you know, sad, stuck and scared uh, in my last life. And although I didn't know I was scared, I didn't know how this would turn out for me coming out the other side, facing my fear and doing it with courage. I am so much happier to be able to talk about a topic that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. and just the idea of nudging or inspiring someone else to be courageous. You know, I could do this every single day. Yeah, well, you're, you're certainly a human being who is living a life of purpose. And Ryan Berman, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the Decoding Purpose podcast. I am just wondering, where can our listeners visit you at your digital home? So they can find me at ryanberman.com. You can find me at returnoncourage.com if you wanted to get a copy of the book. Find me on LinkedIn and Rebecca, I have a uh, this free values assessment tool. It's not, you know, it's not it's nothing that's too complicated. But if anybody wanted a free copy of it, I'm happy to send it to them. Just email me at Ryan Berman at CourageBrands dot com. Fantastic. Well, I will be uh, emailing you for that values assessment, so <laughs> <laughs> so you can look out for me in your inbox. Thank you so much. It's been such a joy to have you on the Decoding Purpose podcast, Ryan Berman. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. Take care. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review. That would be greatly appreciated. And we'd also love you to join the Purpose Movement at Instagram by following us at Decoding Purpose Podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors at Supernova Sound.